Okay, it's just about time to start. And um, I'm Deborah Green. I'm Orange Audubon Society president and a Native Plant Society member, Couplet Fern chapter. Um, and um, I've been into native plants since the 70s. So a long time, I've had a chance to grow them in this one home that we've owned for the last 18 years. So that's the topic, my topic tonight, what it looks like a mature landscape. Um, I've been on the lecture circuit um, thanks to Dr. Doug Tallamy. Um, let me show you the books of Dr. Doug Tallamy if you don't know them, Bringing Nature Home and um, Nature's Best Hope. And in Nature's Best Hope, he says, he, he references the study, um, 2019 study that bird populations are really on the downhill. We've lost uh, 2.9 billion birds over the last 30 years. And so there's an important connection in the survival of birds and our landscapes. So it's not enough to just, he, he says directly, it's not enough to just grow your plants your own native plants and be quiet about it. You've got to teach about it and get your neighbors to do it to make a homegrown national park. And he now has, Doug Tallamy is a um, professor and he doesn't have time to do this, but he has someone working with him on a website and outreach. And it's a great reference there, homegrownnationalpark.org about the caterpillars for birds. Now, uh, some of you have already heard me speak recently because uh, thanks to Doug Tallamy, on the, I'm on the lecture circuit. And um, the main talk I've been giving is Plants for Birds, the Caterpillar Connection. Um, there's several talks out there on YouTube that you can see of that. And so I'm going to do something different tonight. One of the ones that I like the best is the Florida Native Plant Society's Lunch and Learn. And you can just Google that and find them um, and find that talk. Um, and so what I'm going to do different tonight is because I have a mature native landscape, I'm going to do a tour of it. I just happened to have some old footage from when we first moved in back in 2005. And, um, I just happened to have a nephew who's a, a good filmmaker. So, uh, we, we've made a film and I also happen to have a friend, Gabby Milch, who's a lot of fun to walk around with and, uh, talk plants with. So that's what this is. Um, a 42 minute vid yard video. And um, then we'll open it up to discussion at the end and you can ask me all the questions you have. Um, and I'm just really happy to share it following the urging of Doug Tallamy that we've got to do something and make a homegrown national park. All right, I am going to pull up the video. Just one second. Share my screen, hang on. Share, um, video file, and just one second. Should have done this beforehand, but I didn't. Okay, one second, please. Um, okay, here we go. And here we go. All right, I hope you enjoy it. And we'll have to Late talk February, 2005. We've been in here a year and a half and started to do some changes. In this front area, there used to be grass and some camellias. Uh, we took out the camellias and planted these blue stem palmettos. We had lots of this sort of invasive Boston fern and I'm taking this out and, and putting in the coontis. That are they took this their little time to get established. Have you found that with Kuntis? Yeah, Kuntis seem to be, um, they seem to take a little while to establish. But otherwise, they are bulletproof plants. They are. I Everybody think. seems to like them. They make those big red seeds, right? That's right. And they seed in well. So, and then behind them is uh, beautyberry, and that's in the flower stage. But in the winter with the purple berries, you know that the birds love those. That's kind of a survival food for the birds. 
You know, I've been into natives for a long time, and the first, my first motivation when I was a, a, an entomology student was because they would use less pesticides. Um, they, they would have their own insects, but no, nothing pesty. And then in the water days, it was because if you put them in the right place, then they would ne not need any water except this establishment. And now my motivation is the birds. And you're hearing the parallas, and we heard a red shoulder hawk a second ago. Now it's all about the birds because you need to plant native plants to get the caterpillars so that the birds can feed their young. So now, um, Following the teachings of Doug Tallamy, it's all about the caterpillars for the birds. So you need the native plants for the caterpillars. And um, I don't know if you know of his chickadee study, that one of his grad students studied this. And if you um, have, let's see, less than 70% natives, he found that you wouldn't have chickadees because they need natives for the caterpillars to feed their young. And I don't know the exact percent here, but I think I think I'm there because we do have chickadees. So all right, let's take a tour. All right. So what was it, it was before was just a hedge of cherry laurel here that had grown up from the irrigation from these neighbors, um, and it made a good hedge. But cherry laurel, just a, a monoculture of cherry laurel, was kind of boring and. It's only really good when the seeds are here, the robins come and um, so forth. So I tried to make some diversity in here. I'll show you right now what diversity I put in here. So the, the, the robins, they come in the spring. So that's when their seeds are ready, their well, berries are ready. More the, winter, more winter. They're all more winter, okay. Yeah, see them all. Okay, so I put in the diversity here that uh, trying to kind of be like a hydrochemic at Wakaiwa. So here is a, um, uh, ironwood, and here is a Florida privet, which isn't quite with habitat, but it, it, it does go well with shade. And this is a pipe stem, and that is a um, yellow star anise. Oh, I love the smell of those when the aroma of yeah, the you break leaves. a leaf and it smells just like licorice, you know, anise or wonderful. anise, whatever. If you drink it, <laughs> yeah. And then under here in the understory, and I and I just repeated the pattern all uh -huh. along here. Um, so you have at least three or four species for diversity. That's so important. Yeah, and then this is the uh, oh. river oats. Let's see if we can find one with the... Oh, with the seed pod. With yeah. the seed pod. Here it is. And as you'll notice, I've left some non-native plants like the philodendrons. Just, they're okay. They're just, they seem like Florida to me, kind of like... And they kind of hold it together. Yeah, and they don't need much attention. And you can whack them back and they come back. Right. <laughs> So over here, though, it was just grass. As a matter of fact, I have old footage and pictures to show that. But um, I put in sable minor, blue stem palmetto, because it likes shade. And my mother had had it at her house in Gainesville, and I loved it there. So, but what happened was somebody sold me a sable palmetto oh, for being a sable. And, and, and before I knew it, it had started growing up. So there we got it. Look a at all those bees on those flowers there. That's a good attractant. I love the cabbage palm. It's just, it's our state tree, sable palm. It's, it's, it's tree or grass. I'm not sure. <laughs> and, and then that's some Virginia creeper going up it. And uh, it, it can be kind of get thick and stuff, but um, a little bit is really good. It, it has berries that the birds like. Yeah, Virginia creeper, it, is one of the good vines, I think. I feel like there's a couple that aren't so great, but I like the Virginia creeper for sure. And down here, it, this was oh. come up spontaneously. That is corky, corky passion flower. Oh, wow, yeah. so exciting. So I have a lot of uh, zebras, uh, thanks to it. Okay. And you've got a little mini uh, beauty berry forming its berries and looking pretty good for the fall. Uh -huh. <laughs> so here oh. are three it was originally three that I bought, um, saw palmetto silver variety. I buy them from David Dryley over at Green Images, and they told me to put them behind because they'll get bigger than the Sable Miner. And they have, over the past, let's say, 16 years at least, I've had them in, maybe 17, they have been doing really good. <laughs> yeah, I love the color differentiation too. It really, really pops, it makes it look good. And I mean, you know, our house looks fine, but it really pr gives us a lot of yeah, privacy. privacy. I like it. Oh. So this is a coral bean or Cherokee bean, and it it has the red flowers in the spring for the uh, 
hummingbirds when they come back. Hey, did you look at this, uh, your tree here, your, your, oh yeah, you got a lot of stuff going on in there with some little holes from the uh, woodpeckers coming in. Yeah, well in look, you can see up there, it's dead. Oh, it's okay. It's being hold, held up by the oak. <coughs> and, and what this was, was a pine plantation, our lot. Ah. And we, with the hurricane, especially with Charlie, we just moved in right before Charlie in 2003, we moved in and it, Charlie was later in, in in 2003, the, the trees were just waving like this. And so then the roots were damaged. And when we had drought, like three years later, it's we lost a lot. lot. Yeah. But so that one, you know, I mean, anybody else would probably cut that down. But what is it going to hurt? Yeah. It'll just rot out. And in the meantime, it's very good for, for good food source. Good food source. Yeah. And, and maybe cavities for, for woodpeckers. Yeah, some homes. Uh, Condos. <laughs> <laughs> so here my objective is some diversity but also privacy to those neighbors yeah i can barely see their house it's good uh-huh and what was here before was this yalpon holly lots of it in here but um i put in walter viburnum ah. it's just kind of fun and botanically to see the differences the walter viburnum has opposite leaves and the yalpon holly alternate but otherwise they're pretty similar looking the Walter by Burnham took quite a while to, to grow up, but now it's really filled in good. And I planted that little magnolia too, just so you know. Oh, look, this is from the, um, the, the uh, bees. The, Isn't that cool? The native bees. So this bees. is a red bud. It has really pretty pink flowers in the early spring. This one. And I got it from one of those festivals, Kata just a, a little thin plant that they were giving away at the festivals. Mm -hmm. And uh, it grew really good. And then that one over there is even bigger. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, yeah, if you put them in the right place, give them just a minimum of water at the beginning and they will take off. Yeah, you've got a mid-story, a canopy, and, and then you've got your ground cover. So you've got all levels covered. <laughs> yeah. Now here we're coming toward the front door. And I guess I better explain about all these pots first is that um, uh, I'm with Orange Audubon, you know, and uh, we are trying to make a nature center for a long time. And uh, so for a long time, I've been growing plants for the nature center. And also, I, I was a master gardener in Volusia, so I know about the prop squad that grew stuff. Mm -hmm. And so with uh, the couplet fern chapter of the Native Plant Society, we started the prop squad and we, we were selling the plants at our plant sales. So now, Propagation squad, is that what you're referring to? Okay, yeah. they'll do some of those acronyms things. <laughs> but no, that's cool, propagating plants, because native plants have good seeds and they're genetically viable and most of them can, you know, they spread naturally. So if you pot them up, then that's a really important component because you got more plants to grow. And to give away because, yeah, presents. and we'll talk about the native nurseries shortly, but all right, so that's what these pots are all about. Okay, then looking here at this front door, I mean, it has changed different times over the years, so the 18 years we've been here. What was here, instead of this palm tree, was a beautiful sand post oak. One, oh. Because this was, like Wakaiwa, this was sand hill habitat, and that's a slow-growing oak. It was very nice. And then this plant, which people don't even, I never read in a book that it was a problem, but this plant, the, the um, Yellow jessamine. Oh, yellow jessamine. It has pretty flowers in the spring and, you know, it's a desirable native, but it got so aggressive and it choked the plant, the tree, it killed the tree. Mm. Look at these roots back oh here. Oh my gosh, That's, wow. I just you can see those. how that established itself along the tree. Yes. Oh, and there's the trunk of the tree. You can see how big it was. Um, so what are we going to replace it with? What a, It has to be a sable palm. I love them. So we've got this one in from New Smyrna Beach and um, and then I put in a few couple uh, fire bushes and um, this is all in transition. I might take out, I might even take out these non-native bromeliads. Uh, do you think they're making uh, mosquitoes in there? <laughs> well, I think that that's the concern that a lot of um, mosquito control people have and then some gardeners are concerned about that. But um, I think you can kind of dump out some of the water if you really like the plants just got to kind of have a little extra work on it but yeah they're kind of hard 
so my latest thing I'm taking out that's non native is liriope. Because <gasps> it, well, it, I mean, it's just a monoculture. I mean, <laughs> yes, and it's just waxy and it, no, 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 it can't be eaten by caterpillars, is the problem. So wow. here we go. Uh, I, I, I've tried vegetables. I'm not very good with vegetables. Well, you do need more sunlight, although this is your full sun, right? Right here? Do you and think it's partial you sun. It gets okay. sun in. So like four hours a day or something, maybe? Or yeah. not even that much? Yeah. I, I, I just don't have the patience for vegetables. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I grew up these uh, sweet gums. When we get the Nature Center site, they're going to be nice. Yeah, sweet gums, they love to have their feet wet, so they're more of a wetland plant because you said you live in more of a sand ridge community. Yeah, but I'll show you on the other side that, that we, they we can. Do, yeah, we do have a couple sweet gums here. Very nice. I love the red, the, the red sage. It's so happy. Yeah. And that one, the butterflies love for nectar, right? Yeah. Oh, and you got your milkweed here. Yeah, love that's it. not the right species of milkweed. I have not had good luck with the, the native species. Um, so I just kind of watch it with yeah, what goes on. That can be a whole class on its own of how many. There's like 24 different milkweeds. I think I learned that from you about all the different kinds of milkweeds in Florida. So um, I'm just trying to fill in here. Oh, what, what, what happened was um, that the wild coffee, which you'll see over there in, in, in the correct place, it went crazy in this border between us and the neighbors. Coffee, that's what they call oh, it. <laughs> um, and also the... Um, the ferns, the Boston ferns. Yeah. So we weeded that out, and I say we. I have a, a friend that, that I'm paying to help me. It's, it's gotten a little bit much, um, but anyway, uh, I'm putting in some things that will fill in and make this privacy to the next. Got to get that real estate filled with the natives yeah. <laughs> instead of all the invasives. Okay, so. Oh, what a lovely, what a lovely place to sit out here on your porch and yeah. observe your house and. Well, we have, I have pictures, but um, this used to be a uh, foundation plants, you know, the way they used yeah. to do to hide your foundation. Mm -hmm. And they grew up really big and they blocked any window that used to be. We, those we, are we, big, we, beautiful windows we too. We hate to block those. Those, yeah. So we put in these palms and at the time we bought them, they had the, the boots like that one over there. Mm -hmm. And because that's the look we wanted and the natural look. Unfortunately, I think it was the squirrels that. Uh -huh broke them up so they don't look as cool as they did but uh, I, I just love the palms you you get bees like you say at the flowers and then and warblers there's the one warbler the yellow yellow throated warbler that likes to get the skeletonizer on the bottom of the leaves oh that's good so it's a good association of, yeah yeah <laughs> and then I've got a couple of kuntis and ferns and um, here we keep our bird baths, and here we put out a couple of bird feeders. We are in bear country, so if, if the bears are starting to habitually come in through, we, we quit on the bird feeders for a while. Yeah. That's, I've seen the bears pick up people's bird feeders and just swallow them down, just kind of like, a, you know, popcorn. I don't know. <laughs> <crazy>. Yeah. <laughs> so let's see. We'll keep it on going. This area used to have to be mowed. Now it's just mulched. Um, this is a Chickasaw plum, and this has grown quite a bit since the oh, previous look, the owners. Oh, the plums! It's so cute. Oh, yeah. I love them. And it's beautiful white in the spring, just like uh, Washington, D.C., yeah. with all the cherry, cherry blossoms. blossoms. Yeah. yeah. Well, really I feel bad. I'm stepping on your sensitivity mimosa. <laughs> okay, yes, I tried to do sensitive mimosa in here, but I'm really not wet enough. I don't water, uh, uh, you know. Oh, these are so cool. <laughs> these lovely little flowers. I don't see any right now, but yeah, they, when it cute. rains, they'll get more flowers. So, but over there is a wax myrtle hedge. Oh. I'm trying to do. If you remember when we did bird banding, the wax myrtles were the best. Yeah, and yeah. it's for the yellow rump warblers. Um, but uh, well, first of all, with wax myrtles, there's males and females. I don't know if I've gotten the right one. And they need more water than I give here. So, but, but finally that group got going. Yeah, once they get going, and they, they're also called the bayberry, and they use the waxy berries to make candles and things as the pioneers did. And wax myrtle is very, has a real strong odor like the anise, and you can rub it on your skin. And they say it helps with mosquitoes, but I'm not so oh, sure. Okay. But every time I walk by wax myrtle, unless I'm in some place you can't pick, I always rub it on me, <laughs> just ah, for the fun of it. Good to know. <laughs> Um, got your fakachi grass there too. Yes, that needs sun. I've had it in different places. I love it. 
um, that place does good. And that, that sugarberry grew up in the middle <gasps> of it oh, by yeah. itself. I love sugarberry. I'll show you more as we go along, I'll tell you more about that as we go along. But so anyway, this is an area we don't have to mow. And um, this is where we look for the birds. And, and it, we're trying to screen from the neighbors a little bit. And anyway, that's this area. Yeah, I like it. So then oh, let's talk about this. Um, over here were five Ooh, eastern red cedars. And I remembered that they are coastal. Ah. And so I thought, hey, I could, by the way, they had Boston fern under them. So I, I weeded that out. Yeah. And I thought I could put coastal plants. The Maple Street natives in Melbourne had all those plants. And I know they closed for a while, but I understand that they're open again. So, Yeah, that'd be fun to take a trip over there and to look at all the different opportunities we have to put native plants in our yard as well. And in the beginning, because I knew they were from a little farther south, um, when we had a hard freeze, I'd put like a pillowcase over them or, or you know, sheets over them. Um, but now... Yeah, because uh, well, they're have... zone 10 and we're zone 9B. Mm -hmm. And so zone 9B, and plus we've been getting a little bit later frosts than we usually do. We're getting a more February, March, that last cold snap. So things are shifting a little bit. So who knows, we may be rezoned someday, but right now we're 9B. <laughs> okay. Well, all, all these seem to have survived. And the, the wild coffee's gone absolutely crazy. The birds must eat it because it's all over. Just keep spreading. And... Let's see. Uh, I love this plant, marlberry. Oh, marlberry. That's a cool one. And what's interesting about the marlberry is that its fruits are in the spring, and it, whereas most fruits of these f fruiting plants for migration are in the fall. Ah. So it's, it's so the berries will start forming soon. Is that no? That's not flowers for it. So it'll flower. Yeah, that's yeah. Uh, it'll flower coffee. and then it'll get it. So it's really good in your yard to have both spring and fall flowering. Um, uh, also, seed bearing or berry bearing plants. It's very important. Yeah. So wild coffee, as you see, is all in here. Um, Yalpon holly is another dominant, and the big trees are the eastern red cedar okay. and there's cabbage palm that's grown up and uh, it's kind of like a secret place that oh I um, see some oyster shells here what are you doing okay well I'm trying to <laughs> imitate a coastal habitat all right we got our calcium carbonate here yeah yeah and I've also put down just garden lime to try to change the pH but um, the the oyster is kind of giving an authentic flavor yeah definitely <laughs> of the, the coast coastal. like turtle mound I was trying to imitate the plants of New Smyrna Beach there that's a pretty awesome place so let's go around this way and okay. uh, but anyway any wild coffee I've tried to confine to this habitat now right here was a big um, viburnum odoratissimum what do you, what's the common name for that mm, no, I'm not sure okay but it's non-native very waxy leaves oh, and, okay. and not good for uh, the caterpillars so I laboriously took that one out and by the way this dominant tree up here is a, is a wild cherry I'll, I'll show you more of that um, Prunaceratina okay so this plant is really nice is uh, Simpson stopper and it it's also smells good right it has a good odor yeah and I think that the oh it's very lemony I think that Simpson stopper is used uh, to help relieve people with um, digestive issues if you're having problems. I know the Indians, there's a medicinal purpose for this plant as well. So that's the name of stopper? Yeah, I think it stops you up. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. <laughs> okay, I wasn't aware of that. Um, anyway, so it's done well in here, and I really don't even water this after establishment, um, and uh, it, it, the freezes don't bother it, so it's a great plant. And by the way, um, back in uh, 2001, when I was working in water, I, I learned that um, it was the Florida Nursery Growers and Landscape Associations, FNGLA's plant of the year back then, and plus also Walter Viburnum that year. So these are easy to propagate, to get to put in our yards as base plants for a lot of the new development. This would be really a good help. Exactly, and it's sad to me that those two species are still not really commonly grown in the, in, in the, the, the Lowe's and all the nurseries, you well, know? There's an economic opportunity there for some grower out there. I hope they, they get that one going, because it's a lovely plant. Simpson Stopper. So I was talking about that other 2001 Nursery Growers Plant of the Year, Walter Viburnum, which okay. I also showed you up there. 
And this whole area was really well screened from the street with Walter Viburnum. It had grown up really good over the years. Um, and then there was a, a situation where we had a utility easement we didn't know about and they needed to cut out a bunch of vegetation for a utility line for the next community. So I lost a bunch of this, but I've been watering it to try to get it to come back and it, it's kind of a, a filtered screen, but... Yeah, it's getting there, it's getting there. Mm -hmm. And, and, and something about the utility easements on your survey, if you've got a survey of your yard, it's always good to look because you don't want to plant your favorites in the utility easement because it's not yours. You have to share it if they need to take stuff out. So yeah, I wish you told that. me that in the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> um, so these are ones that I propagated from, I guess, when they were cutting them out and, and they're slowly growing. It's a little bit slow, at least some water, but it, they're great. So over here, uh, this is the other side of the uh, coastal. So I've got all kinds of different coastal species that I bought from Maple Street natives. And um, got a couple flowering plants here too. This one's a beautiful purple flower. Yes, okay, this is Vernonia. Uh, ironweed. Ironweed. That's what was in my head, but I wasn't sure I wasn't going to say it. But yeah. Oh, look yeah. at this. What a cool adaptation for the seed pods. Exactly. I love that one. That's very much coastal. Okay, so coming along, and by the way, so I, I have paths and borders, and I learned from uh, from Cece, who, were, who helps me, um, about uh, Aura Barici's yard that she puts down paper. Ah, paper instead of plastic or that black shade cloth, weed cloth, which is not good. <laughs> so I put down paper and then the mulch, and I'll show you the bag of the floral mulch later, but um, this is a good kind of mulch that doesn't hurt cypress swamps or anything, right? And you can see here how, how it's doing a good job. I mean, if you once it's under control like this, there's not a lot of weeding that has to happen. Yeah. Um, so coming along, uh, here is a, a good example of the oh yeah black cherry. Uh, whereas the cherry laurel can be evasive, the black cherry is perfect, and Dr. Doug Tallamy has it cherries listed very high. So this is the one that I wish was more on p on communities lists, like like my community. I'm trying to get it on the tree list to be used. So and it's the cherry. Uh, black cherry. Black cherry black versus cherry or, the cherry laurel. And the yeah. cherry laurel is the ones that kind of comes and takes over um, open spaces because the birds eat them and poop them out. And yeah. Oh, here. By the way. Oh, there goes a deer. There goes Hi. a deer. <laughs> there goes a deer. Coming to eat your Very flowers. Friendly Good morning. to the wildlife here. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. <laughs> and there's this little vine on top of it too. That that one looks like that could be. Uh, kind okay, of yeah, that's cat briar, and and I leave them because they have also have berries. Oh, cool! Look what I have up there. Um, see those little flowers? That's for snowberry, which we'll we'll see on the other side oh, nice. of this. Uh, oh, we got some butterflies coming through of this coastal hammock. And so I've tried to plant um, firebush, and these have taking some water. I think it's just too much strong sun yeah, from this This has angle. pretty woody stem too, so this is an old one, I think. A few years, and, and I know it to be the native species because I bought it from Green Isle Gardens in Groveland, the other major local. Um, Firebush is a really great plant to have in your yard. I feel like they're they're always colorful. They're kind of give you, and they, they have a little fall and a little spring, and they, they are deciduous, and they do drop their leaves during cold spells, but they come back really quick. Yes. Um, by the way, that's a marlberry, and see, that's not in the right place. It's getting too much sun. It, see how much better it yeah, looked you can uh, see it's, over there? It's struggling. You've got some work to do with your shovel here, moving this baby. <laughs> I guess I should. <laughs> Um, okay, and this is more of the uh, Simpson stopper. Oh, this is, seems like a smaller, a smaller, um, more compacted leaves too. I wonder which if they... is it probably an adaptation to the sun. Ah, so in the shade you see bigger leaves. Out here it's less surface area. <laughs> that makes sense. Oh, I see you got sumac. Sumac? Isn't that what is this one right here? No, this is necklace pod. Oh, one of the coastals. Um, okay. Oh, I see. Way different. Oh, cool. Yeah. Remember pop beads that we had? Um, these are the, this is why it's called necklace pod. Oh, that is so cool. Yeah. And uh, it's a good companion plant for the fire bush. Uh, 
and oh, the, the butterflies do come to it, the yellow flowers. And also, it's in the bean family, and I've been trying to get um, a lot of bean plant, mm -hmm. plants in to bring the yellow butterflies. Oh, we got two hawks flying above us, too. <laughs> <laughs> there they go. Um, okay, so what happened was when the utility line was cut through here and we lost some vegetation, the neighbors, the previous neighbors, had the idea, why don't we together buy some uh, saw palmettos, silver, and put them here to make like a, a so, so the, the mowers wouldn't go through in the right. stuff. And uh, David, I bought them from David Riley Green Images, and he suggested put in between some wildflowers like the uh, tropical sage that those butterflies are going to right, that butterfly's going to right there. And, you know, so, I've, and so I'm, that's what we've done, and they're going up pretty well. It's been about five years, maybe. Well, they got the beach sunflower, which is awesome. You got the gallardia, which are also awesome. So the beach sunflower, those can spread and they can really last, you know, they're annual kind of, but they can last and they reseed and come back in the spring. And the gallardia, I just love the color. They're just so happy. happy yes. Things. Oh, Maybe and you too. got your bee balm over there too, right? Yes, bee balm is a favorite of mine now. Okay, so what I did was I took them from over there where they seeded in and I planted them at even distances and um, I think they'll spread in here and pops, possibly they're even too close and I could transplant around and they're, they're not too hard to transplant. I love, I love the dune sunflower. Yeah, and you got a, some of the porter weed there too. Yes, that that's a, a native porter weed, the one that goes horizontal. Ah, okay, so its growth pattern is different than, than the ones that grow tall. These grow more out. Huh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. This is a really pretty area. You know, most people in this community, uh, uh, some of them have problems with skunk vine now. Since, since uh, the hurricanes of 2003, it started spreading mm -hmm. from Winter Park. And we do not have any because I, I, I recognize it and I'll weed it out. Let's see, what else? They have Boston fern. That could be a problem. Yes. They have, uh, what's the other thing? Um, the vine. Uh, air potato. Oh, air potato. Yes. It has the most beautiful heart-shaped leaves, but boy, oh boy, is that a problematic plant. I've done a lot of air potato raids in my days. <laughs> well, we don't, I don't have any of that in here because, you know, I, I do the weeding and I know what's what. But there's a new invader. That's the the plant <clears throat> and it makes these tiny little seeds and so so many of them we spent so much time trying to pick up all these seeds and it grew all up in here it was quite a project i did it on the reed weed wrangle day ah uh, i never entered my, the photos but it was quite a weed wrangle hey you can did. see how it's climbing up that tree just as we're here and know? there's some just along <laughs> the fence over there but so this is like a, a an early infestation that i'm trying to make the homeowners association aware of if we could try to nip it so there's invasive plants there's there's invasive um, exotic plants and then there's native invasives so we have it's kind of complicated I sometimes feel like trying to explain to people some plants are taking over the world but <laughs> yes okay the only ones I have, have had trouble with that are native that are kind of invasive are uh, wild coffee like I told you yeah because so then many I, berries and then I told you about the uh, yellow jessamine yes yes that one choked my choked plant out your plants and then the cherry laurel seeding up everywhere. I'll, I'll show you some seedlings. Just, in a it's a great volunteer plant. But look at all how these are spreading, these little beads. And if, oh, yeah. from the Amazon, they, they, they like make them into necklaces and things. Oh and my gosh, it's the rosary pea. It's look, the rosary it's so pea. so cool. Look at that. It's got a little, and they used to use this for jewelry making, right? Yes. I don't know. But, uh, so like I've collected a bunch and I don't even know what to do with it. Uh, to I don't want to start an infestation anywhere um huh. i knew i knew the plant but i didn't realize it because i've seen it grow up in more of a shrub like thing versus a vine or maybe it it's had a already vine. established it's itself. a vine yeah it had already established it but man now that you i see just oh my goodness that would make me crazy i'd have to be out here picking up all these little berries it's days and days <laughs> of it there's so many <laughs> Oh, All dear. right, so now you can see from this angle what um, the yard oh, looks like. Oh, there goes like. a cardinal. <laughs> and yep, plenty of cardinals love it. And look at, see, okay, this used to be a pine plantation. So you can see how the pines are in, in rows. And you can also see how many are dead. And then 
you might see stumps because we don't we just let them fall they they rot out in the center and they they're light so they really don't hurt anything when they fall the our, our slash pines here yeah it's pines are pines are a double-edged sword i think they're so important in florida because of the long leaf pine component and then mm. we've got a lot of the the um the wetland loblolly pines and things and then then these ones the slash pine and that I guess you have to tell how they, which ones they are by how many uh, le uh, their needles. How many needles, yeah. yeah threes and uh, fours and fours. Let's see if we can find some as we get closer yeah. to the pines. Well, we'll probably see more on the way. <laughs> yeah. Like right here, um, they have twos. So and that's with the slash, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and I don't think we have a single longleaf on our property. I regret mm -hmm. to say I love the longleaf, and I don't think we do. Um, but across nice. the way, there are some long leaves, and I really wish they had protection status in Florida, being that the range of them has yeah. decreased they, so they much. They were the dominant tree in the most of that upland habitat for thousands throughout the, of years. Throughout the <laughs> southeast, and, and like at Wakaiwa Spring State Park, yeah. where they burn them, and they, you know, so they're in good condition, there's certain birds that need that habitat. And, I think and, eagles also nest in them too. Because mm -hmm, like they're that. so tall. Yeah. yeah, well even here though we get pine warblers. Um, you might hear, that's it. Do you hear that trill? Yeah. Um, that because we have at least slash pines. So here on this uh, wooded area with the oaks as the dominant, um, I have, I'm keeping out anything coastal like the wild coffee if it seeds in here. And um, I, I put the Kuntis here. They do not do well at the beginning, and maybe this is too much full sun for them at, at all, but they, they're not looking too great there. It always makes me so sad when I see the municipal governments planting them in the islands, in the full sun, in that extreme heat, in those mm -hmm. cement areas. It's like, wow, they're native plants and they're supposed to do well, but that's not an environment. Wrong plant, wrong place, I think, sometimes. <laughs> And uh, this is another coral bean or Cherokee bean. I've, I've, I've got seedlings of those and I've been scattering them around because that's such a great plant. I'll show you the biggest one I have over there. Or what. And then this is just an old wax um, crepe, myrtle. crepe myrtle that I'm leaving, uh, even though it's non-native. So there's a couple non-native. Uh, so Kind of, they kind of have been naturalized in some respects. I mean, people do have a lot of them out there and they spend a lot of money taking care of them. Yeah. So here I tried to make the wildflowers of the sand hill with um, both grasses and, and flowers. And I learned that from David Dryley. You, you make it natural, you mix grasses and wildflowers. And I guess there's a little shade and I, I've, I've bought a lot of annual and short-lived um, sandhill plants that have not made it. It seems like I'm always re trying to replenish this to get it to have some more color. I just put in that uh, Asclepius tuberosa, yeah, one of the native. the native. I, I saw some other milkweeds in the back. Yeah. Is that the partridge pea? No. Yes, I just yeah, put okay. those in too. Those are so, I love those. They're just I, so bright and happy. I love them too. They don't need much attention after establishment and they bring the yellow butterflies. Ah, for all those those sulfur butterflies that fly around all the time. The yellow and behind it is the um, goldenrod, the, oh. the sandhill goldenrod. Oh, sandhill goldenrod. That's a really special plant because there's not a lot of those around. And then I could trim this back a little. It's gotten a little big, but this is the uh, bee balm and oh. it'll, be, it'll be really great for all pollinators. Mm. Smells so good too. It's more of a basil-y kind of a fresh smell to them. There. That's right. It, it is in the mint family. Yeah, you can tell about the square stems when you feel them. So here I planted this turkey oak and I kind of, this was a wrong place thing uh, because there was a sand live oak above it and kind of hit up upon that. Yeah, uh, so I turkey got, oaks are awesome. I made mistakes in here but um, uh, basically, you just kind of have to have a little patience, uh, a lot of mulch, uh, w water for establishment, and, and I don't think I have any of the drip things left. I've taken them out, but in the beginning I used drip irrigation, Mr. Landscaper kits. Ah, that's so smart because then you can you can put it in different areas. It's and you're not really dragging a hose, but you are. And then once it's established, you don't need to water it anymore, except in extreme drought situations. And you can take those out even and yeah. give them away. 
So let's keep on going down here. Yeah, and you don't have to use all that lawn equipment. That sometimes I can just always hear it in the background everywhere with the mower and blowing and going. It's just like grass is a, is a great ground cover. And I like this because this is really a Florida grass to me because it's not, it's not really, you know, one variety. It's green and you mow it and it looks good. And I, and I, that I'm kind of favorable for it. I know it bothers a lot of people because it isn't just you know, monoculture one variety. But I think, you know, in Florida with our water crisis, this is a really good alternative to all, to some of those grasses that suck up our water. And so this community is not uh, one of those that brings out the green sheet and tries to say if, if your yard is green mm -hmm. enough. And that is technically illegal. Right. Um, there were 2009, lots. since 2009, Florida Friendly Landscaping laws have come in in Florida and gives us the right to have an alternative landscape with less inputs and more water saving than what we have right now. But I guess in the lawsuits that have occurred, and, and no one really wants to get involved with the lawsuit, it, it, it's all been about how, how it looked. So that's why I've tried to just do everything kind of gradually and have some design to my landscape and uh, people walk by all the time and when I'm working out here they're always real friendly to me and so some some t people want a tour and all so it, it's worked in this neighborhood it's good. yeah HOAs are, are unique like that I live in one that it's it's a much more grass oriented community and like a couple weeks ago when it was so hot and we were having 100 degree temperatures every day I stopped in my HOA association and just reminded them that this is not the time to be sending out letters about people's grass because they even had problems with their grass and we just can't you be using 50 percent of our water supply that's drinkable to be putting on on that kind of landscape just for aesthetically pleasing purposes that's right it's the biggest crop in Florida grass right yeah it's the biggest crop and uh, doesn't need to be I mean it would be much better for the birds um, th this is the <gasps> oh, wild grape. <laughs> yay, muscadine grapes yeah. yay. wow you've got a lot of grapes here I don't really <laughs> see that many that's pretty cool so let's go in and and some of my design principles that I've just kind of intuitively come upon are, you know, you want to curves like nature has curves rather than squares, you know, and also these entrances kind of are inviting to the eye, yeah. these paths. There's a really good landscape architect designed with nature, nature, Rick Darkey, and his talk at the Native Plant Society mentioned these pathways and I'd already started doing it. Hey, is that gopher apple over there? No, those are seedlings of the um, that sand live oak. Oh, okay. <laughs> I do have a little bit of gopher apple in there. Uh -huh. it, so it, I've got gopher apple in my yard, and I tell you, it's been a challenge in some respects. The guy weed whack it down, and it comes back all the time. Now this is a um, tough babelia. Ooh, this is a has a quite a smell. Yeah, and um, look at the pretty undersides with the Ooh, rusty leaves. Rusty color, yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's attracting a lot of bees now, so it's, it's good for that. The native pollinator is important, important. There's over 302 kinds of native bees that you don't think a lot of them nest in the ground and leaf cutter bees and things. We saw some back there. So here, um, it, 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 this, that Mexican petunia had grown all the way to here. I remember <laughs> that because this, I put in this little citrus, uh -huh. which isn't doing much, it doesn't get enough sun. But I had to weed that all the way back to there to where the neighbors are. And then I put in a couple new plants. This is kind of a, a new area work in progress. But first, let me show you that this is a sugarberry that I planted oh. 17 years ago or whatever. Wow. And look at how big it grew really fast. That's some pretty bark on it, too. Yeah. And we really like sugarberry, we birders, because at the Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive, there's a lot of it there right at the entrance. Uh -huh. And that's where we look for the warblers. Um, uh -huh. The, Ooh, and we know butterflies coming in. <laughs> they, they, there are lots of little caterpillars, so you will see warblers getting the caterpillars, and plus the little berries are are the right size for birds. So, so the caterpillars, when they hatch, their main food source is this leaf, and so that's the relationship between the two plants. So, so the butterflies lay their eggs, and then the caterpillars come and. 
So it's a larval food source, right? Is a larval that, food source. Yeah. And then, see, the caterpillars are perfect for the stuff down the gullet of a little hatchling. Ah, oh yeah, they're tiny, like little, little... Uh, little and soft. Yeah. You don't have to... Good get, protein for the little birds. So that's basically the, the story of the caterpillar connection with native plants and the, and the songbirds. Yeah. Very they, important. We don't think about those things when we get in our car and we drive to the shopping center and we go to Publix and we buy our food. <laughs> what are the birds eating? Mm -hmm. I wonder sometimes. Mm -hmm. So here I've got one other um, sugarberry seedling that I dug up somewhere ah. here and um, I'm planting it and it's growing pretty fast. That's about that's about four months. Oh wow, that's got a good it's got a good start on it. And my friend Cynthia that we bought Cynthia and Perry we bought this house from uh, she gave me this from her where she lives now on the coast. This a little uh, eastern juniper? red cedar. Oh, eastern East, red cedar. Yeah, juniper is another name for it. Eastern red cedar or juniper. And so it'll grow up. And by the way, I have one in there that I planted years ago that it, it grew kind of tall. I usually well, over there in that hammock oh, area. Yeah, that it depends they, on how much neighbors it has, right? Yeah. Now, didn't the olden days, the um, the settlers planted their cedars by their wells? So oh. people knew as they were traveling where there was an artesian flow that they could get water from. That's some historic stuff I picked up over the years. Oh, that's fascinating. And, and then the, the berries uh, they use for gin. Oh, right. That's always good to have. And stews. <laughs> So <laughs> flavoring, <laughs> yummy. Um, so and, and when I there's palm seedlings here and there, and I just try to think now, would this be a good place for a palm? Yeah. Should I let it grow? It's a big commitment <laughs> over the years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they take a while. <laughs> well, I appreciate your time today and showing me your yard. Thank you for coming. Okay, that's it. Hope you got something out of that, seeing a mature native landscape. Are there any questions? Gabby, uh, my friend Gabby is supposed to be coming on to answer questions too. And, um, but please put your questions in the chat if I can answer anything. Um, you have in that last slide, some of the um, references. This one, Orange Audubon's Bird and Butterfly Friendly Plants for Central Florida has got all these plants listed. Any questions? I got some great jobs. <laughs> I'm glad you're here, Pierce. Um, Delcy, Delcy wants to go birding in my yard and you're very welcome. We'll, we'll work that out soon. Delcy's a great photographer. Um, and Pierce one commented that I hadn't even thought about the point about the caterpillars. Yes. Uh, people love Doug Tallamy, but maybe the idea of the caterpillars feeding the birds, the nestlings, maybe they didn't quite put it all together. So I, uh, I hope you will now and, and try to get the plants with the best best for the caterpillars. And Terry says, did you get hackberry butterflies on the sugarberry hackberry? No, I never did. That was why I originally planted them. Um, when I read about those beautiful butterflies, the uh, hackberry emperor and the tawny emperor, and we have seen them at the Lake Apopka Wildlife Drive on the sugarberries there, but I never got them. But I do see birds around the sugar berries eating the little caterpillars, the microlepidopter on it. And uh, Pierce asked, uh, how did you learn so much about certain native plants thrive? The amount of sunlight water uh, was just experienced over time. Well, there, there's books and there's, um, you know, the, the native plant society people love to pass the information. There's a lot of personal passing of information. If you go to Backyard Biodiversity Day in October, um, at Mead Gardens, that then you'll buy the plants from the um, people who know and they'll pass them information or even at the native nurseries. Yes, native nurseries are so specialized that the owners really know a lot and the workers there really know a lot. So, um, but yes, I've tried different ones that didn't make it 
and I've tried a couple that went invasive on me. Besides the ones I've mentioned, um, one that I don't like, and uh, my discussion with Valerie, she thought it was a, weird that I didn't like it, but um, blue curls went crazy in my yard, so I don't like blue curls. Um, but yeah, just a little bit of experience, um, bit by bit, and um, Delcy says her HOA won't allow native plants in the front yard, unfortunately. Well, that really is um, unfortunate, and uh, but do what you can in the backyard to create habitat. Um, what else can I answer? 